2 Samuel chapter 11. We're going to be in verse 1 through 5, and we're actually going to read a little bit, skip a little bit, read a little more, skip some more, then read a lot more to kind of gain a full picture of where the Lord wants to lead us today. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Amen. You all right with that? Yeah. Good, because we're doing it anyway. Here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 11 says this, in the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out for battle, David sent Joab and his servant with him and all of Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he, was, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent to inquire about her. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Jump to verse 14 says, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and he sent it by way of the hand of Uriah. And in the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and killed. Now think about this. The king just slept with this man's wife, impregnated her. Now he's sending him off to die in battle with a letter about him dying and he's the one delivering his own death sentence. This is what David did. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the mourning period was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David did displeased the Lord. Father, I pray right now that today's word, Lord, would reprove us, cut anything off of us that isn't of you. I pray, Lord, that we would learn to be a people who, who resist, repent, and refocus our eyes on you. I pray that right now. Lord, give us wisdom and revelation in this place. Enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can know you better, Jesus. That's the point of all this. And we pray that to happen this morning. And it's in his name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Listen, before you're seated, high five three people and tell them these three words. Resist, repent, refocus. Resist, repent, refocus. Resist, repent, refocus. What's up, CWC? How y'all doing today? Are you good? Come on, if you're good, shout, I'm good. Amen. Well, I know it's, it's so good to see each and, and every one of you here this morning. I know John had already said that, but I'll reiterate that because we mean it. We mean it. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, really quickly before we jump into this thing, I, I do just want to recognize a couple things really quickly here. So one, I'm extra excited today because we have some family members with us today. My aunt and my uncle came in from out of state to be with us. My uncle Jesse and Aunt Georgie. He just wave at them, just give them a wave. Yeah. They have, have been with me through a whole lot of bad, but now it's a whole lot of good. Amen. And uh, it's incredible. Um, you know, they've, they've been there from the beginning and uh, have encouraged me and prayed for me. And, and now they're getting to, to see what God is doing. And it's just, it's so, it's so amazing. God is so good. Amen. Amen. And, and really quickly too, on behalf of my wife, Julie, and I, I just want to say thank you to, to everyone, man. So, so October was Pastor Appreciation Month. And and man, I got to say, man, we thank you guys so very much for how, how much you made us feel loved and appreciated. Uh, man, you guys, you guys are amazing. You're amazing. But can I be really honest, though? It's actually kind of tough on us this month is every year because we have to sit there and, and, and listen to you guys go far above and beyond, right, with all the gifts and the cards and the nice words that you speak over us. And, and we're sitting there like, we don't deserve any of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're not worthy of it. And so, man, we, we just feel so blessed and privileged and honored to, 
to be the pastors here at CWC, and, and that's a, a thanks to you guys, a credit to you guys. And, and Julie and I, it's funny because whenever we get to go and be guest speakers at other, other places and minister alongside other ministers, man, we brag about you guys everywhere we go. We're like, no, your church is okay, but ours is better. Like, it's cool. <laughs> like, it's cool, man. You know what I mean? Like, we hate to compete against you, but we're going to because that's what we do. You know what I mean? Like, I'm always competitive. I don't care what I'm doing. I mean, I'll be thumb wrestling and beating my, my eight-year-old, like, every time. Don't even matter. My four-year-old, nope, done. Or she's 10, whatever. <laughs> it's not the point. It's not the point. <laughs> no, but man, I'll tell you, you guys are amazing. And listen, man, we've had a good year this year. But, but can, I, can I tell you something? The best is yet to come. I promise you that. I'm telling you, you haven't seen nothing yet, man. Jesus is going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask, think, or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. Amen. Amen. Meaning his spirit alive and well in us and us believing, right, in, in what God is going to be doing. And so we rejoice what God has done, but we celebrate what he is about to do by faith. Amen. Because he's good and he only has good gifts for us. And so if you believe that, man, give the Lord a shout of praise real quick. Yeah. Amen. But we're going to jump right into this thing this morning because we got a whole lot of years to cover and only a few minutes to cover it. All right. So we're going to, I'm going to do my best. We're going to try to make it through all of David's life today, man, because remember, we're going somewhere. Come on, touch your neighbor. Say, we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Yeah, because remember, man, we are in a year-long series, a year-long series titled The Saga of Salvation. And we're going through all these um, stories of old, seeing how they are all pointing and revealing the mystery of salvation that we so freely enjoy. And, and it's amazing to me how all of Scripture points to Jesus. It all points to him. It's, it's all about him. Every single bit of it. And what's crazy is the moment that, it, that that became evident to me is the moment that he came alive in me. And this is important because the Bible says this, that Jesus is the living word of God. Amen. And because all scripture points to him, if we live according to it, we live according to him. And if we live according to him, we become alive in him. Amen. Amen. And can I actually say it like this? Listen, Kanye West said it best. I'm telling you, he said it absolutely best. He said, listen, the moment that I read God's word and I gave my life to Jesus, I went from asleep to awake. That's what he said. It was incredible. It was incredible. He said it the best, man, because the word of God takes us from asleep to awake, from dead to alive. And, and this is so important. And you know why it's so important we're alive? Scripture says that he's the God of the living, not the dead. He's the God of the living, not the dead. So if we want to live for him, we better be alive in him. Amen. Amen. Yeah. But because that's the truth, man, we, we need to be in his word. And, and God has us going through his, his word, right, seeing all these different stories, right, and that we're calling scenes. Remember, we're calling them different scenes. And up to this point, we've been through eight different scenes. We've been through the creation scene, the fallen perfection scene, the crown scene, the, the, the call scene, the exile to exodus scene. We've been through the judges scene and the milk and honey scene, and now we're in the prophets and kings scene. Amen. Amen. And we're seeing how all these different scenes point to one major scene, just one major scene. It's all accumulating to one major, major scene. It's all pointing to the only begotten son. Every story in here is telling us of the one story called the saga of salvation. And that's why we are, are doing this. This is the goal for the year because it was the order by way of the Lord for the year. Amen. And it's been a little challenging, I will admit, um, but it's been, it's been really, really good. And so, listen, today we're going to go from 1 Samuel chapter 18 clear to 2 Samuel chapter 12. So I hope you guys have your, your speed caps on, tightened down, ready for quite a ride here this morning. And I hope you brought an extra snack in your bag or you stopped by and got something at the cafe because we're in this to win this. Amen. Um, no, but we're going to do our best to get through all of it. And, and what we've seen so far, right, is, is David is the anointed king. 
And what we've seen is, is how he was faithful in the anointing. He was faithful in his serving. He was faithful in his keeping of his father's sheep. He's being faithful in the anointing. And because of his faithfulness, right, God continues to bless him, doesn't he? He just continues to bless him. And what we've seen last week is how God was with him and enabled him to destroy the giant that was trying to destroy him. Because God was with him and because the battle is the Lord, the thing that was trying to defeat him, he was able to defeat it. And what we talked about last week is that even though we're not actually fighting a giant named Goliath, which I hope you're not, amen, that would be scary, okay? But we do have giants that we are fighting. We all have giants that need to be that we need to be slaying in our lives, giants of, of fear and anxiety and depression and hurts and, and pains and jealousies and envies and, and offenses. And we have all these different giants, whether it be drug addiction or alcoholism or porn addiction or anger, what, whatever the giant is, these, there are many different giants that we need to slay. But although they're different, the way we defeat them is the exact same. It's the exact same. How we defeat what is trying to defeat us, even though the thing trying to defeat us is different. What you face may be different than what I'm facing. But the way we defeat the one we're facing is the exact same. See, Scripture says this. He is Jehovah Nisi. God, our banner that reigns over us in victory is what that means. It tells us that he has anointed our hands for battle. That he is our refuge and our strong tower that the righteous run into and that they are Saved. See, see, our victory is found in Jesus. It's, it's found in Jesus. So although what we may be facing may be different, the one we run to is the exact same. Is the exact same. And because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because he is the same. That means the same God that delivered David from his giant will be the same God that delivers us from our giants. Amen. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, see there's, there's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm going to start singing that song if you don't watch out, I'm telling you. So I'm not backing down from any giants. I'm telling you, I'll go. I ain't scared of it. I ain't scared one bit. I'll karaoke all day long. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not backing down from any giants. You know why? Because I know how the story ends. I know. Jesus already told me. He already told me that in this life, I'm going to face giants of many kinds. I'm going to face trials of many kinds. But I can take heart. I can be of good courage. I can stand on my feet and have peace because he's already overcome every single one of them. I mean, I sure hope that that encourages you today, for tomorrow, and forever. Because God's already given you the victory through his, his son and we see this in David's life. He's fighting this giant named Goliath, and God gives him the victory. And all of a sudden, man, his, his fame grows. His name grows. He has this major name recognition. He goes instantly viral, right? Like that's what we would call it, right, in, in our today lingo. He, he goes viral, man. All of a sudden, he's got thousands upon thousands of followers, his Instagram account keeps breaking down because of how many people are trying to log into it at the same time, right? Facebook is going off the chart, man. They're, they're all going after King David to be king, the anointed king. He hasn't been appointed king, but, but they all realize just who he, who he is. And his fame and his name grew every day because the Lord was with him. See, God gives favor to those who give their lives to him. This is what he does just because he's a good God and he blesses them. If we hand the battle over to him, he will, he will make sure we walk through it victoriously. Because our God always triumphs. And God gave him the victory time and time again, King David. The Lord is with him. So every time he goes out for battle, God gives him the victory. And what's funny is the people begin to make up a song about him. They begin to make up a song. They start, they start singing a song about the current king and the, the anointed king. And, and the song went something like this. It was like, Saul killed his thousands. Sounds pretty good, right? Like, sounds pretty good. Saul killed his thousands. Like, yeah, I can. I'm sure Saul was sitting there like tapping his feet to it. You know what I mean? Like, I killed my thousands, sing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but then the next line says, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed, killed his tens of thousands. 
And because of that, the current king, Saul, became really jealous of the anointed king, David. Now, now look, I do want to be fair to Saul, right? I do want to be fair to him because I would say most of us would have a problem with this. (laughs) For real. I think most of us, this would make us pretty mad. And before you sit there and get all high and mighty on me and self-righteous about, no, it would never be me. I would never get jealous over somebody. Well, just remember the other week when when your boss recognized your coworker for being on time every single day, and you begin to tell everybody around you how they were never on time before. So I don't know why (laughs) the boss was giving them accolades. (laughs) Or the time when mom and dad took, took your brother out to dinner for having a, a, an A on the pop quiz. And you begin to remind mom, well, mom, he has a C on the, on, on the actual report card. So the A on the pop quiz don't even matter, mom. Right? Like, this is what we do. This is what we do. This is, this is human nature. We've all gotten jealous of what people do and what people have at some point in our lives. But, but we really have to be very careful to take that to the Lord. We have to take jealousy to the Lord because that's our flesh. And scripture says that we've got to be led by the spirit, not by the flesh. We got to be led by the spirit and not by the the flesh. The flesh will want to get jealous. It will want to. And see, Saul becomes so jealous at David that he begins to try to kill David. He begins to start throwing spears at David. David's only trying to help the dude, for real. David's going out winning the battle on his behalf. David's singing songs to him, right? And he's like dodging spears as he's singing songs. Like, like as the deer panted for, right? He's dodging another spear. Like, what is this crazy man doing? Like, what is happening here? Trying to sing to him. He's throwing spears at me. He's sitting there trying to, to kill him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 20, it reveals why Saul was so jealous and angry of David. And this is what it says in verse 31 of 1 Samuel chapter 20. Okay, Saul's talking to his son, Jonathan. And he says this, For as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will ever be established. Therefore, go bring him to me, for he shall surely die. See, one of the main reasons that Saul becomes so jealous with David was because of his own son. Because of his own son. It's because he wanted it for his son. He, he wanted his son to have the fame and the name and the, and the position. And so he starts to throw spears at David over it. And I tell you what, man, I find this to be one of the biggest reasons that we become jealous of other people. is because of our kids. Be, because after all, right, our kids are the most perfect kids on the entire planet. I mean, my God, what, what, what do you mean? They're the prettiest. They're the, the, they're the smartest. They're the most talented. They're the most gifted. It's our kids. So obviously our kids deserve all that. I see this in, in sports all the time, by the way. I see it all the time. It's like, praise the Lord, right? I'll see parents come up to the coach and say, you know, my kid really should be playing quarterback. They really should be. I've, I've seen them throw the football. I've seen them run with their brothers and, their, and the kids in the neighborhood. Like, I've seen them. They deserve to play quarterback, but you're holding them back. You're holding them back. And the coach most of the time is trying to be really kind. Right? And I can see this awkward moment t- taking place. And the coach is like, okay, what do I say here to defuse the situation? And they're like, well, if the kid just keeps working hard, maybe one day they'll be quarterback trying to be very encouraging. When actually in the back of their mind, they're thinking your kid can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And the reason they're better than everybody else that they're playing with is because they're five years older than everybody else they're playing with. Just relax, mom. Dad, chill out. We become so blinded when it comes to our own kids. We become so blinded. We become so blinded and so we become so jealous. Jealous of other people because we think our kids deserve it. And you know know what what, what it is? It's actually understandable. I have kids. I get it. I have kids. I I get it. I think my kids are the greatest. I hope that don't offend you. Actually, I don't even care. My kids are my greatest. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just saying, like... So it's understandable, but although it's understandable, God doesn't give us a pass to do it. God doesn't give us a pass. And and look, I'm sure as I'm sitting, as I'm standing up here talking, you're sitting there, you could start pointing at all the Saul's in your life. You could start recalling all the people who have been jealous of what God has given you. You could start to, to point. And I would actually say that most of us, when this subject started, I started talking about it. That's instantly what we did. We started thinking about the people who are jealous of us, the Saul's around us. But just for a moment, I want to go a different angle. 
Instead of pointing at the Saul's around us, we ought to be pointing at the Saul's within us. Begin to see how we've become jealous of other people and what they, what they have. Looking at what others have, what others are doing, and what others have done, and think, they don't deserve that, I deserve that. They shouldn't have their business. They shouldn't have their position. They shouldn't have their ministry. They shouldn't have their wife and their kids and all those things. They, they shouldn't have any of it. It's becoming Saul's within us. And it's really easy to do this when it comes to our kids because we think our kids deserve everything. They deserve it. They deserve it all. And so that kid shouldn't be receiving what they're receiving because my kid should be the one receiving that. My, my kid deserves that. That kid doesn't, doesn't deserve it. See, we got to take this kind of stuff to the Lord, man. We have to take it to Jesus and give it to him. Because scripture says this, that when we operate in jealousy, we operate worldly. That's what it says. That jealousy will cause us to, to, to throw spears at other people. This is what jealousy does to us. And, and I hope to God you're not actually throwing a real spear or a knife, like you know what I mean? Or we got problems. Like, I need to help you. Come and see me. But... But we do shape our words as spears. And we start throwing them at others that we're jealous of, trying to cut them with our words. See, see, jealousy becomes so heavy on us that it becomes to blind us. And you know what we'll actually begin to do is start praying against those people. We'll begin to start praying against them. And if it's, if it's really blinded us and the jealousy is really heavy upon us, I mean, we'll actually start to use scripture for our benefit. Start praying things like, oh, the vengeance is the Lord. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. Lord, you said you're the judge, so judge them. This is what we do. Listen, Lord, I need you to judge. It's funny because God doesn't need to be reminded he's king. Did you know that? He don't need us to remind him. He don't need us to do that. He doesn't need to, to be reminded that he's the judge of, of all. But what happens when we become so jealous, we start to, to pray against people. And did you know this? I'm going to give you something and take this with you. This is really, really good. It's something that God revealed to me. So if we're praying, our own will be done. If we are tr trying to provoke our will, we are in rebellion, which is the same spirit as witchcraft. If we begin to pray, our will, Father, my kid should have that. They shouldn't. My kid, make them great. Them not. God, I want them. I want this. I want that. When we start to pray our will, it's rebellion against God and it's witchcraft. Jesus gives us a great example of this in the Garden of Gethsemane. The only Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, He's in the garden, He's getting ready to be crucified. He says, Father, take this cup from me. I don't want it. Take it from me. But He follows it up. But not my will, but your will. Jesus understood if he started to pray his will, he'd be in direct rebellion of the Father, operating in witchcraft. we got to be so careful not to be praying our will, but your will. That's why scripture says when you pray, pray this way, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the way we are to pray. See, see we're, as Christians, we should be celebrating each other's success, celebrating, praying for God's protection, not judgment, praying God's grace, not wrath. You know, I remember this one time, right? I was with this pastor and I won't say any names, but I was with him and they were upset at another pastor. Okay. Pastors do this for real. It's terrible, but they do some of the worst actually. But anyway, we're sitting there and he begins to tell me about this other pastor, right? And he was upset because this other pastor was having great success. His church was growing really fast, really rapidly. And he was upset about it and he was jealous about it. And so he starts to run him down. He starts to say, well, they're not really doing it the right way. Well, they're not really preaching the full counsel of God over there. They're about entertainment instead of worship and blah, 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 blah. on and on and on and on. Just bringing this guy down. And I said, I said, huh? I said, how about this, man? Let's try this. How about we pray God's favor upon him? How about that? How about we pray God's grace upon him? Do you know why? Because it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's not the wrath of God that causes people to come running to God. It's God's kindness towards them that even though they deserve this, God gives them this. It's the kindness of God. 
that leads them to repentance. And, and so, man, if we think that people are off a little bit, or they need to be focused on the vision, start praying God's favor upon them. Start praying God's goodness upon them. Because I'm going to tell you right now, we start doing that, jealousy will stop dead in its tracks. There's no way for me to be jealous of someone when I'm the one praying for them. God bless them anyhow. God, strengthen them. Be with them, Father. Not God, reveal it to them. Right? Like, we love to do that. God, reveal it. They're off. Get them. Like, who the heck do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Like, no, 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 no. Father, protect them. Bring them into your kingdom. Let the Lord Jesus give them favor. James, actually chapter four is really, really good. This is what it says. It says, if we speak against people and we judge people, we are speaking against the law of God and we're judging the law of God. That's what it says. And he says this, that if we're, if we're judging the law of God, we can't live under the law of God. You can't do both. We can't do both. Man, we gotta make sure that when jealousy rises up, man, we stop it in its tracks. By praying God's blessing upon people. By praying his favor upon them. And see, this is what is happening with Saul. See, Saul can't get out of his own way. Saul was so jealous of David that it actually caused God to remove his favor, remove his spirit, remove his blessing off of Saul. It withheld it. This is what jealousy does. And so Saul begins to, to pursue after David, trying to kill David. And did you know he tried to kill David 21 different times? Tried to kill him 21 times. And that's significant because in the Bible, numbers mean something, by the way. Yeah. It's significant. The number 21 represents this, a sinfulness in selfishness with rebellion. That's what it means, 21. And so here, this is what's happening with Saul. His, his jealousy is such a point. It, it's caused him to, to be completely operating in rebellion against God. <laughs> Because something we got to realize, it's God who gives and takes away. It's not us. It's God who does it. And when we're upset that God gave someone something, then we're operating in a rebellion against God, the one that gave it. It's not about us. It's about God and what God is doing. And this is where Saul is at this point in time in his life. And the jealousy has caused him to go completely insane. He is a madman at this time. And this is what jealousy does to us. It causes us not to be able to operate in an emotional, calm state. We lose our emotions. Well, I can't believe they got this. What's happening? What's going on? We lose our, we lose our emotions. And the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, church. It's self-control. And so if jealousy is causing this to rise up in us, man, we got to make sure we take it to the cross. Take it right to Jesus. But Saul is operating fully in this and fully in his flesh. And he's trying to, to kill David. But, but God is so good. He's so good that he gives David an ally in the castle. The ally being Saul's son, Jonathan. Scripture says that their love for one another surpassed the love of a woman. Do you know the world tries to pervert that love? It's not a perverted love. It's not a perverted love. God don't pervert anything. God creates. He doesn't pervert. Right. It's not a perverted love. It's a, it's a real love. It's, 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 man, we're best friends. We're boys. You know what I'm talking about? Like, yo, know, what's up? You dap each other up. You know what I mean? A little chest bump. If you're men, <laughs> maybe in that, yeah, get in the game. Add a boy. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it is. It's, it's BFFs, right? Like, we're best friends, man. We'll ride or die together. This is the love that they had towards one another. They would die for for one another. Can, can I tell you this? That, that everyone needs a Jonathan. We all need a Jonathan. And we all need to be a Jonathan. I can hear Bree in the back saying, Amen. <laughs> Amen. That's her husband, by the way, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> we all need a Jonathan in our lives, and we need to be Jonathans in people's lives. That we will ride with them, that we will fight for them, that we will cover them and protect them. And I'm telling you, man, I have a couple of those people in my life, and it's amazing to have those people around. I know this, that if I call them, come hell or high water, they're there. It don't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Where they're at, what they're doing, they'll come right to me. That's the same way with me with them. We need Jonathans, and we need to be Jonathan. See, Jonathan's love towards David caused him to protect David by warning David of his father's plan, of the scheme of his dad to kill him. 
And because of this, David was able to escape Saul. He was able to escape death. And, and he goes on the run, right? He goes on the run and he finds himself in caves and in foreign lands. This is what happens. And here he is, he's at some low times, some very, very dark times. And this went on, okay, for seven years, David's on the run like this. He's depressed, he's broken, he's hurting. But you know, he learned something in those times that he'd have never learned in any other time. Amen. Those times taught him that no matter what happened to him, God was with him. Didn't matter. It didn't matter what happened. That God would never forsake him, never leave him, nor forsake him. That God would always be for him. And in Psalms chapter 139, right, I love this psalm. It's incredible. It says this, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. <laughs> if I make my bed in the pit, if I make my bed in Sheol, God, you're, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. There your hand will protect me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me is, is night. Even the darkness is not dark to you, God. That's what he says, so good. The night is as bright as day for darkness is, a, is as light with you. How I many of you are so grateful? That no matter how far you run, you run into his arms. That, that no matter how low we get in this life, we're never out of God's reach. His right hand will sustain us. His left hand will guide us. This is the God we serve. We can never outrun the spirit in the presence of God. No matter where we go, he's there. And this is what hard times teaches us, by the way. I'm not saying I, I love hard times because I would be lying if I said I did. I don't pray for hard times, I promise you. But this is what it teaches us. That's why the book of James says rejoice when you face trials of many kinds because these trials that you're facing is building your faith in who he is. It is revealing to you how much God actually loves you. This is what hard times do. And David's in this extremely hard time. For seven years, he's on the run from his, for his life on the run for his life, never knowing when his number's gonna get called that day. 21 different times during that seven years, Saul tried to kill him. But finally, it all comes to an end when, when Saul's life comes to an end. And finally, the one that was anointed king becomes the appointed king, finally. And he's 30 years old when David takes the throne. 30 years old when he finally becomes king. And by this time, man, David is, he's that dude, man. He's one of the most powerful men in the entire world. He's got the baddest army around. He's got as much money as he could ever want. And this is where the story picks up, what we read in 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel chapter 11. And what's happening here is it's springtime. It's springtime. It's when all the kings and all the men are off at war. But David's at home. In other words, David isn't where he's supposed to be. How many of you know if you aren't where you're supposed to be, you won't be doing what you're supposed to be doing? Because when you aren't where you're supposed to be, you aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. See, if you go to the bars after work, Instead of being home with your wife and your kids. You decide you just go to the bar instead. And bad things happen. You know why? Because you aren't where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be home with your wife and kids. When, you, when you're supposed to get up early for work, but you, instead you oversleep because you're tired. You stay home. The next thing you know, you're looking at websites you shouldn't be looking at because you're all alone. Why? Because you aren't where you're supposed to be. So you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be getting the house already and ready for your husband to come home because he's just worked 70-hour weeks and he's been traveling on the road. But instead, you're, you're not where you're supposed to be, so now you're engaging in a conversation on social media that you shouldn't have been engaging in in the first place because you're not where you're supposed to be, so now you're doing what you're not supposed to be doing. Monday morning, you wake up and you're 
tired, you're frustrated, you're arguing with your spouse and your coworkers because you skipped church on Sunday morning. You weren't where you're supposed to be to get the strength and the encouragement you need to finish another week. Instead, you stayed at the house because you weren't where you're supposed to be. Now you're acting how you shouldn't be acting. This is, this is what happens. And see, this is what happened with David. David was supposed to be at war, not up on his house chilling. He's supposed to be at work. And he gets up one morning and he's out walking around on the roof and he, and he sees something that he wants. He finds himself in sin, which sin will only lead to more sin. That's the only thing sin can do. Sin leads to more sin, church. That's what it does. And so he finds himself in this, this sin. He's in an affair now with, with a married woman, with a married woman. And because of the affair, now she's pregnant. Bathsheba's pregnant. And what does he do? Instead of repenting and stopping, he tries to cover it up. He says, ah, I don't want anybody to know about this, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover this thing up. And he ends up killing the man's, the man who is married to this woman. He covers his sin by killing the husband. And scripture says that this is so displeasing to the Lord. You think? Hey, you think? <laughs> but, but it's actually very important that we read that because we got to realize that sin displeases God. See, we live in the age of grace, which by the way, we do. This is the age of grace, man. Now, when Jesus returns for the second time to come and get us, the age of grace is finished. It's done. It's over. It's over. He's coming back with a sword coming out of his mouth, striking down all who oppose him. If your knee hasn't bowed before he comes, it will bow that day. And then it's too late. But it's important to, to realize this, that God is, is not pleased with sin. Because we live in this age of grace, we think that grace is a safety net for sin. It's not. Grace is the power to keep us from sin. Amen. Amen. See, we can't fall into stinking thinking in our lives and think, ah, God's cool with a little bit of sin because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so I'm cool. I mean, I wake up brand new mercy every morning. That's what it says. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. We love to pick out just little parts instead of reading the whole thing. When Paul says, yeah, that's true. Grace does abound because grace is more powerful than sin. Yes. But does that mean you sin or keep on sinning in order for grace to abound? No. Instead, tap into the power of grace. See, we must resist sin. Hebrews chapter 12, verse one says this, and I'm, I'm gonna wrap this thing up. It says this, we must Set aside every sin, every sin that so easily entangles us. Grace enables us to do this, to set the sin aside, to, re, to resist it. First Corinthians chapter 10 says, no temptation has taken you such as common to man, but God is faithful. That in the midst of the temptation, he will not put it on you more than what you can bear, but instead will, find, will give you a way of escape. In other words, grace will help you to endure it and to resist it. This is what is James chapter four, verse seven says, submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Not he might flee, not he could flee. Maybe one day he'll flee. No, no, no. Resist him and he will flee. If we resist sin, sin will flee from us. The devil will flee from us. This is, this is what it is. It's, it's incredible. See, see, David should have resisted, but instead David insisted. He didn't resist. He, he insisted. He said, I want her. I want that. I want the thing I'm not supposed to have. Bring her to me. And because he insisted, he found himself swallowed up in sin. And here comes along a prophet, hence the title of our scene, by the way, Prophets and Kings. See, the prophet Samuel now is gone He's, he's passed away and a new prophet is on the scene whose name is Nathan. And Nathan is David's friend. And Nathan comes to visit the king one day. And I, I can't imagine how the, the conversation probably played out. I'm sure they're friends. And so he shows up to see David. And he's like, hey, what's up, man? How are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? Everything's great, Nathan. That's what David's saying. Pastor, everything's perfect. I'm good, man. Thinking that Nathan doesn't know what he did. Thinking his friend is not hip to what he had just done because he tried to cover up all of his sin. And Nathan begins to tell him a story. 
Nathan says to David, he says, yeah, hey, there's this rich man I want to tell you about. There's this rich man, and he has all these flocks. He's got so much that he don't even know what to do with it. He has everything that any man could ever wish for or hope for. He has it all. He said, but he has a neighbor, and the man has one lamb, just one, and he loves the lamb. It's, his, it's actually his pet. Like the kids love the lamb. We all love, the, they love their lamb. And the rich man has this guest that comes in and wants to hang with him. And the rich man, instead of killing one of his thousands of sheep or lambs to feed the guest, he steals the lamb from the poor man, his only sheep. He says he kills this lamb. He slaughters it and feeds it to his, his friend. And the Bible says instantly David becomes infuriated. Where is this, this rich man? Where is he? Bring him to me because I want to kill him. And I'm going to make him pay back four times what he just stole from this poor man. Nathan looks at him and says, the rich man is you. David, you're the rich man. You had all these wives. You have all these treasures. You have everything any man could ever want, and God would have given you more if you'd just asked him. But instead, what you did was is you went and stole something from a man that only had a little. You stole. Then you killed the man. The rich man is you, David. Do you know what David did? He fell on his face and he repented before God. See, David could have done anything he wanted to do. By the way, David's the king. He can do anything he wants to do. We just found that out in previous verses and chapters, right? He took a man's wife, right? Slept with her, then killed the husband and nobody did anything about it. They just let it go on. No one said a word. He could have done whatever he wanted to do. He could have killed Nathan, but instead he... He hit his face and he, he began to repent before God. And can I just tell you this? Nathan was a good friend. These are the types of friends that we need in our lives. Friends that will tell us when we drop the ball. Friends that will tell us when we're off a little bit. Friends that will come and confront us with decisions and choices that we are making. These are good friends. These aren't friends that we steer away from. These are friends that we invite into our homes. Friends that will look us in the face and say, man, you need to repent. You need to repent. You need to stop looking at that crap on your phone. You need to stop sitting there messing with that, that Facebook and all that stuff. You better knock that off. These are good friends. This is good for. So here, this is what happens, right? So Nathan tells David. David repents. And do you know what scripture calls David? A man after God's own heart. What? It doesn't even make sense, Jack. He's, a, he's an adulterer, he's a murderer, he's a thief, he's a killer, straight killer. He's killed tens of thousands of people. He's a killer. Matter of fact, scripture says this, that he had so much blood on his hands, God wouldn't allow him to build the temple, wouldn't let him build his own house. He said, no, David, you cannot build my house. Build your own. You got too much blood on your hands to build mine. My, my, my house is, is righteous, it's holy, it's sacred, I can't let you build. But yet, God says, this is a man after my own heart. And the, the, the answer to this is real simple why he said that about him. Because David always repented. He always repented. Jesus says this, keep with the fruit, keep with the fruit of repentance. Keep with the fruit of repentance. In other words, man, make sure that, make sure when you find yourself in a season of sin, you hit your face and say, Father, forgive me. Because if you do, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. The blood of Christ will wash it all away. Every bit of it. Scripture says that a righteous man falls seven times every time he gets right back up. He says, yeah, I screwed up. Father, forgive me. I'm going to keep moving. We have to be a people who live a life of repentance if we want to be a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart. A person who ain't afraid to repent. And I screwed up. I dropped. I, I messed up, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me. But we have to live a life of repentance, not confession. Whoa. Not confession. These are two different things. See, confession is, hey, man, this is what I did. I screwed up. Oh, well. And go back to doing what I've always done. Repentance is, 
Father, forgive me. And I turn a 180, not a 360, a 180. And I head the opposite direction. That's what repentance is. This is living the life of repentance. See, see, David lived a life of repentance and which caused God to say, this is a man after my own heart. And did you know after David repented, he refocused. After he said, Father, forgive me, he then refocused himself. You see, this is what sin does. Sin blinds us. It clouds everything around us. It separates us from God. And so now everything is cloudy around us. When I think about refocus, I got to think about a camera. Right, a camera, when you're trying to, to take a picture, if you're not in focus, everything is blurry. And you got to take the lens and re, re, refocus it, recalibrate it get, it, get it fixed so you can see what you're trying to take a picture of. It's the same way with our lives. We find ourselves in sin. Everything becomes blurry. The picture now is distorted. And we got we to gotta refocus it and fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith named Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, we, we got to be a people who resist, who repent, who refocus. Resist, repent, and refocus. Go ahead and stand to your feet, please. Church, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, who he can pick off. That's what he's doing. This is what he's doing. And because we know that to be true, Scripture says that sin is crouching at your door, waiting for the moment to pounce, waiting for just a crack, just a little crack. Scripture says don't give the enemy a foothold. Don't give him even a foothold in your life. And because this is what he's trying to do to us, then we've got to be quick to resist him with everything that is within us and do you know how we do that by the word of God see the word is the sword of the spirit it's the sword of the spirit and when we need the word of God to combat sin this is how we resist the enemy for him to flee as we get on our knees and be in our words and see the heart of the father the kindness of God but yet there's going to be times when we do, we, we, we miss it. Maybe for a lack of knowledge or whatever the case may be, it doesn't even matter. Why? There's times we're going to find ourselves in seasons of sin. And in those times, it is so important to repent. Father, forgive me. Forgive me. And we do that by getting on our knees. Bearing our heart before God. Not trying to cover it up before God. God already knows. He already knows. We got to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. We, we, we pray. This is how we repent. And after we repent, repent, we have to refocus. You know how you refocus? Worship. Worship. Worship is the way that we will refocus our lives back on him. See, scripture says that he inhabits the praises of his people. So when God inhabits us and he comes down to make his, his resting place with us, our eyes will refocus right back to him. Oh, this is why I live for you. I see it now. I remember now. Jesus, you're holy, you're perfect, you're righteous, you're majestic, and I just want you. Resist repent and refocus father we thank you for your word today i pray each and every person here in the sound of my voice whether they're online or whether they're right here father i pray that you would touch them and help them to resist i hope in the seasons they find themselves down that they repent and father they make sure they hit their knees and begin to worship to refocus on you so that they can see the victory hallelujah I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see